Good evening, everyone. My name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society based in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area in the U.S. This evening, we have our second Guardians of Nature meeting for the month of May. And uh, with your input, we are working on projects and also recently um, enjoying inspirational speakers. So this evening, from about 7 to 7.30 or so, we have a wonderful speaker I'll tell you about in a moment. And at 7.30 or so, about 30 minutes later, we'll begin on projects. I want to remind you that last Thursday, the first meeting, the first Guardians of Nature meeting for the month of May, we were delighted to have speaker Patty Donnellan, who is the sustainability coordinator at the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in Cleveland, Ohio. And she presented an excellent program on woody plants for birds. You can watch that on YouTube, so do go and watch it at the WC Audubon YouTube channel. Now, let us get to our speaker. Uh, Tammy Fierro Zeiss is from Audubon, Washington and Audubon, Miami Valley. And she will open our program tonight with an important story about climate disaster. Tammy will share her story, and then she will invite us to talk about what we learned. Stories like Tammy's bring us closer to the future that is already here. Conversations like this one help us to become more awake so we can work together effectively to solve re and respond to climate change uh, here on Earth. Um, thank you guys for joining. I really appreciate it and I'm very happy to be here and sharing this story and I hope that when it's done, you guys can take away some, some things about the seriousness of not just when these, these incidents occur, but how long it takes to rebuild and the far-reaching effects. Um, so I want to start off with addressing this photo. Um, it is not filtered. Uh, I want to stress that this was actually taken in front of my house in September. Um, while a wild, wildfire raged mm, right across the next hill, I could see the flames from my front yard. This is taken at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It is so dark that we needed flashlights. It was like this for, for months, actually. Um, and the air quality was so bad that we couldn't leave our houses. Um, people ended up having to evacuate simply because of that. And I wanted to also address another thing in this picture. You don't see any birds on the telephone poles. You don't see any other wildlife. And that's pretty normal, honestly, for this time of day. It's 3 p.m. There's going to be birds out. There's going to be other wildlife out. We have so many hummingbirds during the summer that it's crazy. You can't walk outside without one getting in your face. But there's nothing here. And what you don't see is the fact that the air quality is so bad from these fires that birds and other wildlife is, are literally suffocating. Um, I can't find the Facebook post now, but in our birding group for the Portland, Oregon area, there were numerous posts, post after post of people posting pictures of birds that they can't help because the wildlife centers are shut down because they're in a fire zone and they're suffocating. Just pictures of dead animals, dead birds livestock that you, they had to be abandoned because it was either they leave right now or everything burns, which means things like horses, cows, sheep, whole farms are just left and there's nothing they can do because they may not have the resources to evacuate or they may not have the time. And that's what you don't see in this picture. In this picture alone, all you can see is that the sky is so dark, I need a flashlight to get to my car, and it's 3 p.m. And the sky is just 
on fire. And I want to stress that is the tone for these kind of climate disasters, because it's not just an, uh, a, an anomaly. This isn't a year, like a random event. This is year after year, and it is now May 2021, and parts of California have already been on fire for two months. We are starting to have fires in Oregon, and it should be raining, but we've been in a drought for two months. According to scientists and several papers, and you can actually Google this fact, um, scientists predict that this will be the worst year for fires in Oregon's history. And there are many places in Oregon, which you'll see in the pictures, that have not recovered still. Towns that have just stopped existing. So we're going to move on to the next slide, if it will let me. But who is affected, really? So this is actually a beautiful shot here in Idaho. When I think of Idaho, I think of potatoes, but Idaho is a magical place, actually. The Craters of the Moon National Monument, September 2020, and the sky is blue, but weirdly hazy. And that's actually smoke from wildfires that have drifted hundreds of miles, way far out. And that's what that haze is. Even in the middle of Idaho, where there's really a lot of fires where we're at, it's just haze. And you can think, well, okay, so there's wildfires, but it's mostly in unpopulated areas where, you know, they, they can't fight them adequately, or, or maybe it's in just fields like this, or maybe it's in the Grand Teton National Park, that haze, it's fire, it's smoke. Um, normally that's a crystal clear blue sky, but we actually would see um, large birds. So I saw an osprey actually that was sitting on a rock and it was panting because even at that visibility level, there's still particles in the air and their, you know, their lungs are not built for that, much like our lungs aren't built for that. So maybe it's things like this where it's our wildlife, our national monument, things that we are proud of in our country that are also being affected. Or maybe it's also people. That's a town. That's a town right outside of south of Jackson, Wyoming. And if you look down at the bottom left hand of the screen, in other words, you're just going to see people who are now watching the very real, real possibility that their houses aren't going to be there in the next couple moments. Because the fire um, departments by that time are so overworked that there's just too much going on. And so it's a, it's a matter of, do we just let a town burn or do we save the next one that we have a chance to? Um, what you don't see in that picture, it isn't just that little spot. Um, if you look towards the right, you'll see char um, way off in the distance. That's where an entire mountainside has burned. And because the shrub brush there is so dry from drought, um, and heat brought on by climate change. There's, I mean, it's just tinder. It's kindling. It goes up in moments, and it just barrels down you, down towards you, and there's not much you can do. Um, and I, I just want to take a moment and pause and really have you guys look at that picture. This is the middle of nowhere, and, and you don't see fire trucks. Um, there is somewhere out, out of the frame a helicopter that's taking water from a nearby reservoir and dumping it. But even that, I mean, it's, it's one helicopter upon acres and acres and acres of fire. That, too is affected. And and I want I know I'm focusing on the wildfires because that's really the most visible thing. I mean, as we all know, most of the southwest and western states were just on fire the majority of the year. They're already starting to be major issues. Um and we as a family have an evacuation plan because of it. Um last year we were lucky enough that it made it down the hill and then stopped. This year we might not be lucky. 
And that, I want to say, isn't just one part. So I traveled from Cincinnati, Ohio, all the way to Portland. And I want to say during that time I saw beautiful, wonderful pieces of land and, and vibrant environments and ecosystems. But I also very much saw the effects of climate change on not just environmental populations, but on human populations. And this was one very poignant instance. And then we get into the other part that ties back more into home turf, Cleveland, Cincinnati, all the Great Lake areas. Um, so we all know about the toxic algae blooms. Um, they're a very large issue. Um, and, and many people, like, maybe not, don't think about it that big. Um, but because of the algae blooms, because I have personally talked to some of these people, uh, fishing is almost impossible in certain areas. There's also an access issue of clean water. Um, and because of these algae blooms, right, there's massive fish die-offs. So again, that impacts fishing, but it heavily impacts the ecosystem. And when people think of these, they think of, of course, the main proponent, which is fertilizer and other farm wastes and phosphates getting into the system via runoff. But they don't think about the other piece because climate change doesn't just affect, right, oh, the, war the weather gets warmer and there's more, um, you know, intense climate, intense um, weather instances, anomalies, right? But it's not an anomaly if it happens every single year. And what Cleveland right now, at least um, in this particular instance, um, what's going on now is that every year the algae blooms are getting more and more intense. Maybe not as widespread, but more intense or toxic. And one reason that is it's because harmful algae bloom normally during the warm winter, summer season or when water temperatures are warmer than usual. And in this regard, warmer water due to climate change may influence algae blooms in any of the following ways. Toxic blue-green algae prefer warmer water. And because warmer temperatures prevent water from mixing, this allows algae to spread wide and grow into thicker mats. Algae blooms absorb then the sunlight, making water even warmer and promoting more bloom. This suffocates other life around it. And that is directly, I want to make note that that's directly taken from the EPA government website. This is not some random news article. This is from the government noting that yes, this is a direct effect of climate change and therefore climate disasters. And I know that maybe algae blooms don't seem like a climate disaster, but when you think about all of the effects and how intense this issue can be, and I'm focusing on this one because it's the most noticeable right now. It's a disaster. It affects so many people. It affects the environment around it. And that's just by personal narrative. And of course, I have my sources cited, so I implore you to check these guys out. Uh, they have wonderful links. Um, I especially found the epa.gov um, article very informative. But I want to also talk about why this narrative is important. For me personally, I know that when people talk about climate change or when they talk about climate disasters, it's almost like this far off idea. Yeah, but does that affect me personally? I, I mean, I know the seasons are getting more intense and it seems like our winters are getting really warm and our summers are having some really bizarre weather, but that's all I've noticed. But seeing this firsthand, seeing how this affects others, I, I hope that this narrative bring that, brings that a little bit more home base to you, that it's not some far off distant thing it is a future that many people and many swaths of the ecosystem are living right now, and some of the damage is irreparable. I'm going to go back real quick to this photo. 
There was a town here. It is now 2020, and they're going to have another round of wildfires in this area. They're not even bothering to rebuild the town. What's the point? And all of the ecosystem. Trees take decades to mature. They didn't even get six months. That's why this is important. And I implore you to really look at different sources. But more than that, please reach out to your senators, your Congress people, local representatives. They do listen, even though it doesn't seem like it. Write letters to or business organizations. Please do grassroots movements as well. Look into those. Look into any local organization that you could donate to or your time funds, um, resources, especially those that focus on things like clean water and access to better resources in order to promote green spaces or promote policies that help defend these resources and help fight climate change. Because we, we don't have all that much time left um, in terms of fighting a lot of these issues and we can't ignore them. Obviously, a lot of people can't ignore them because they're in their face now. Um, and it's really only going to get worse. So again, I, I hope this has been informative. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But with whatever remaining time we have left, I would love to open it up to discussion on any personal narratives that you have or any resources that you think might be handy for others to hear. Thank you, Tammy. Um, please unmute your mics. And I know that Tammy was hoping for a conversation. Hey, Leno. Hi. Um, everyone, I'm Dr. Antolino Davis from the Bahamas. and. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this presentation. It was very heartfelt, and I can tell that you really experienced a lot. But, um, down here in the Bahamas, we got hit really hard with Hurricane Dorian, and we actually have a type of pine forest in the Bahamas that is actually fire regulated, so it naturally burns every year. Not the whole thing, but in patches. Unfortunately, due to Hurricane Dorian in a climate accelerated storm, it killed a huge amount of that forest. So now there's a bunch of standing dead pine trees. And unfortunately, that means that there's a lot of firewood that would not have been there before. While the trees are alive, they can fight fire themselves, but now we're gonna have to deal with that so I just want to say that this um, presentation really touched home for me. I was on the those two islands that were hit hard by Dorian this past two months, um, doing work with them. And so um, hopefully we don't have any really bad stories to share, but there is some recovery going on right now, like the natural environment. And of course the people are, are trying to build back and stuff, but um, I look forward to talking to you about what happens and um, maybe we can talk more about our stories together sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually want to touch on that. Um, a lot of forests in Oregon are fire regulated. They do uh, also thrive on that. However, I know that now there's an issue of it's too much, right? And now there's all of these dead trees from the previous fires. And so, it's, like you said, it's just, it's like firewood. Hopefully there's nothing, hopefully nothing too too bad happens in your area as well. But I know what you're talking about in terms of it's just, it's just too much. <laughs> uh, Gloria Ferris, I live here in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, both of you are talking about uh, regulated fires in your areas that 
have in the past um, been set uh, on purpose so that the the forest can be uh, maintained and and continue to grow uh, with help from um, these regulations. I guess what I'm asking is, I think now is the problem that all of these fires started by uh, lightning and sometimes like the Smoky Mountains was set by two uh, young men. Uh, they're not in the scope of regulation. So it's accelerated what's happening. It's making these uh, rogue wildfires uh, more intense, more devastating. I, I, am I getting the right uh I think yes. Yeah. Yes and no. So with the regulation there there are regulated fires that they do set sometimes at least in my area that I'm I'm speaking from. Um and that does help because certain trees interestingly enough um actually thrive um in in fire. They'll they'll breathe that way. It's really neat. But the problem begins when you have acres upon acres of intense burning fire, especially if it is preceded by drought. Um, when it's, it's almost like a, a, a small bonfire is great. You know what? It gets rid of the dirt and leaves. I know people do it in Ohio. That's the thing. They'll have a little bonfire, gather up their dirt and leaves, and that's fine. But if you set your whole yard on fire, that's a problem. It's, it's very much a thing of, yes, the trees do have these regulated fires that, that help them thrive, right? But on the other hand, you have these out-of-control wildfires that are back to back to back, and it, it just decimates the forest in a way that it is not prepared to handle. And while it may grow back, it takes decades to do it. That's what the problem is. And, and more, like you said, there's also that human interaction issue or lightning strikes where they're having more and more incidents of people either purposely setting fires or people not listening when, hey, this is a high fire risk area or any number of things. And then that ups the scale of these wildfires. Um, does, I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I think I also want to clarify that when I said our habitat is fire regulated, mm -hmm. it's not fire regulated by human beings. Yes. Our pine forest in the Bahamas, the pine trees naturally shed their needles and those needles can be lit by lightning strikes or other reasons in the forest and their bark actually, if the bark catches fire on our pine trees, it just peels off and falls away from the tree or the sap will explode and put out the fire. So those trees naturally, they fight fire for themselves and they, caught, they, they encourage fire to burn through the underbrush and kill all their competition. But this, um, this super storm hurricane Dorian killed a bunch of them so they're not shedding needles that will burn through quickly they're standing dead trees that the whole tree will be on fire and that tree on fire will then be able to catch a lot more trees and then keep the fire going a lot longer and when you add to that the debris from homes and buildings and the wood and the there are still vehicles in the forest, some of them have fuel and oil in them. And so there's all of this that we're, we're thinking about. And normally, naturally, it's only, you know, a few acres might burn. But now you have a contiguous area of thousands of acres of standing dead pine trees. And that's a, that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I, I want to piggyback off that. I know in my area they're trying to fell as many trees as possible, but now there's an issue of 
overfelling. So mm -hmm. now you have a large swath of a mountain that doesn't have any way to stop erosion. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a very multi-layered issue. And to describe it as, oh, these are the wildfires and they're just harming everything um, is probably a very um, big simplification on, on my part. But um, to get into the topic deeply would take a kind of a deep dive. Um, and I, I suppose for me, I think climate disaster, when you think of these wildfires, I also think of like things like access to clean water, like in Lake Erie, or the windstorms that are happening um, sometimes in Cincinnati where they just knock your roof off now and they're not tornadoes. Um, or like for instance, Dr. Ana Salino, um, there's Hurricane Dorian, these, you have these climates, these storm, um, basically megastorms, and they're happening in rapid succession. That's, that's what these climate disasters are, is this uptick, right? So that's, that's just a little clarification on my part. I'm, I apologize if I didn't um, do a good job kind of making that point. Uh, Tammy, I don't think there's any reason for apolo uh, an apology. I know that your uh, presentation tonight was to give us an overview of what you personally uh, experienced when you pulled into Oregon in Portland and how hazy it was and how it was like night at 3 p.m. and and all of the other things. Uh, so I'm thinking that as you were traveling uh, west, were the views, the horizon, was it getting hazier as you were getting closer to your destination? And and what did you think of that? That here you are leaving Ohio where we have Lake Erie and algae blooms, but you're going west and now there's the devastating climate disaster ahead of you. Yeah. Um, it definitely was an interesting experience. Um, at first, I I just I thought it was haze, you know, because we get we get haze in Ohio. It's just like a, a summer haze, and it's either from, unfortunately, pollution or just dust that's kicked up from the farms or whatever. Um, but then at some point I realized it was smoke and you couldn't see the horizon really anymore. Um, and then at that point, you know, I asked my significant other who was traveling with me and uh, he explained that the fires, even though they weren't near us, the smoke carries so far that it just like blankets whole states. Um, and we actually at one point had to change course because all of the highways in Oregon, save for one, were on fire. And I don't mean like they had fire around them and they were shut down. I mean, they were on fire. Um, California, we had thought originally we would go through California to get up through Oregon, but California was basically non-passable. And there were parts of Wyoming that were starting to be non-passable. And Utah and Idaho, Colorado. It was definitely a harrowing experience because there was a moment where it was questionable whether we were actually going to make it there or whether we'd have to just wait it out, whatever that meant. Um, the stark contrast between the two environments. It's, I mean, Oregon's beautiful, but the way they operate, these two to see ecosystems operate are totally different between Oregon and Ohio. And of course, Oregon has deserts um, and also crazy, amazing pine forests. Um, but the climate disasters that Ohio faces, especially the Lake Erie, the Great Lakes regions, I would say are on par with the wildfires because both severely access 
both human and wildlife populations, just in very different ways. Um, I will say that an, an access to clean water is something that did strike me as a need in both places because with the wildfires, um, because of the ash in the, the area, you couldn't leave water out for your pets or birds. So you would have these suffocating, thirsty creatures, um, wildlife, and people originally at first were like, okay, we'll leave some water out for the deer because there wasn't any water. But then you couldn't do that because the ash falling down would make all of the water toxic. Ah, and that, that of course made certain reservoirs toxic and you couldn't drink from streams. And since a lot of Oregon gets their water from mountain streams, that was a huge issue. And we were under boil advisory for like a couple months, much like parts of, uh, you know, like Ohio, um, all, all of the border towns along the Great Lakes, I know some of them are under boreal advisory pretty much all year round. So, yeah, that's that's how it, it was definitely um, a hard to describe point in time. Mm -hmm. Ami, um, may I ask, I, I know that you're uh, an avid bird watcher. Mm -hmm. As you were traveling across, one, I want to know, like, how stark was the difference in, you know, when you took off and you're, like, looking at these different birds and kind of, like, documenting that versus when you got there. But I also want to know, like, how did it feel? Because basically, like, I'm always talking about migratory birds because I'm in the Bahamas. And we have your birds for most of the year, and then they go up there to mate. And whenever I travel back and forth, I always think like, hey, I'm just like a migratory bird. And you like picked up all of your stuff to move across the country, but then like something's getting destroyed. Like if, if birds are doing that same thing and they come back and their whole home is like busted Gone. up. Yeah. yeah. Like how, how did that like, like were you worried about like you would have the things that you expected when you get there and like, I, oh, okay, so this is like a two-part question. So I am an avid birder, <laughs> and I was stoked about this trip, even though it was in the middle of COVID, <laughs> so we couldn't talk to anyone, and we basically camped in our car the whole time. Um, I left at late August, early September, which incidentally was during some awesome migratory periods. So I got to see some amazing birds. I got to see a roadrunner firsthand. They are absolutely as fast as the cartoon makes them out to be, and they're amazing. <laughs> um, quail, so many quail. Quail are very round in person. They only have one shape, and it's this. Um, <sighs> ospreys are huge, huge. Got to see one really up close because he was just chilling. Um, and seeing the change in what birds I was seeing was amazing. Getting to my destination and realizing slowly that I was seeing less and less birds because of the fires was awful. And then getting there, and I, I think I left this part out actually, um, we got there and the day after we landed, in Portland, we were told we might need to evacuate. I had shipped most of my stuff that I needed, I guess, a couple boxes, um, and it took them three months to get there because of the delays in the postal service and everything. And when they got there, there was a worry of like, great, they're here, but everything might still be on fire next month, so what do I do with this? Uh, getting there in my car, because I have a little tiny car, it is not, not any of those vehicles, it is a Chevy Spark, so it's about as big as a smart car and a half. Um, I'm thinking, oh great, we're going to have to flee the state 
was an interesting experience. And I, I want to say flee the state and clarify on that because it wasn't like we could go to the next town over and be safe. Where we were at in the state, all around us was on fire. The coast, the coast. And when you think West Coast, it's not cute sandy beaches. It's rocky, jagged cliffs. It's very wet. Um, it's cold most of the year. That was on fire. There was no way to safely escape if we really needed to. We literally just had to hope that one of the back roads wasn't on fire because all of the highways were shut down too. I, I hope that answers your question. It is not something I want to go through again necessarily, and I certainly don't want the environment around here to go through again, but I know that this year is probably going to be much worse than last year. Well, thank you, Tammy. You um, have brought us um, an honest conversation and a firsthand experience. And I want to thank everyone who is here to hear it and witness it and also to participate from where you are. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, well, with I, that. I do want to say real quick, though, I know this sounds all doom and gloom. It super does, and I apologize for that. But please, if there's anything you take away from this, please reach out to your senators, organizations that are environmental organizations, um, congressmen, representatives of any capacity, and please make your voice known that you care about political issues and specifically that you care about laws that protect and help prevent different types of climate disaster and help do things like build infrastructure and help protect clean free water resources. Um, just as a personal antidote again, um, there were several laws that passed in Washington, because that's who I volunteer for out of on Washington, um, that will help prevent and hopefully protect, um, help prevent environmental disasters, but hopefully protect not only humans, um, but more importantly, um, environmental resources that we all depend on. You can do it, I promise you, but you just have to take those first steps and it's not too late to, to help prevent all of this. You just, have to reach out and be very vocal about the fact you would like to protect these resources. That's it. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Uh, well, thank you uh, for the cur your courage and your perseverance and for sharing your firsthand experience with us so that we can have get just a little closer to, as I like to say, the future that is already here. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone who joined. We're, and I hope, uh, Tammy, that we can stay in touch with you Absolutely. and hear, hear from you again and reconnect uh, in, the, in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys again for having me. Happy to share uh, okay. the story. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to projects. Anyone who is here is certainly more than welcome to stay on with us for however long you wish. And I'm going to share my screen now and get back. Um, and here we are. So our next component of this week's Guardians of Nature is project work. All right, and just very quickly, I want to bring you up to things that are have that are successes and also things that are currently going on. So, as I mentioned last week, the artwork donation project has been launched 
that it was uh, started and carried out and uh, authored by um, Sean Missig, who is here on this call. And we want to thank Sean very much. Please go and check out this wonderful artwork collection that Sean has created for us that includes a wonderful nature photography and beautiful poetry. And those pieces are uh, as fundraising uh, effort for the chapter. The second thing is the spring membership campaign that's been launched and well underway. And we have had many people who have either renewed their membership or come on as new members. And if they do choose to do that, they can get actually get a couple of months at no charge for the annual membership, as well as we do at the end have an awesome raffle for new members. Our Native Plant Online Sale has concluded for May. Uh, not, not all of the plants were sold as they were uh, in April. And the June plant selection is now posted at the store. Uh, most things are accessible off the front page. Just look for the navigational button, click it, and then it'll take you to where you would like to go. And the last announcement is uh, we do now offer a selection of tilth soils also at the store. Uh, they're made from food scraps. They're made in Cleveland, and they're made by Rust Belt Riders. Uh, they provide a serve composting service to residents as well as businesses and uh, uh, large organizations throughout the region. Um, the soil, we have three different selections uh, to feed seedlings and rich bird-friendly native plant gardens and four to five houseplants. Again, go to the home page and you'll see the navigational button to it, to all of these things. Uh, and all of these efforts are fundraisers with for the chapter and proceeds go to Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. Uh, our recap that this was included in your email follow-up that was sent out and just a couple of updates. Uh, Drina updated the book planning group. Um, Nancy updated us on the International Bird Banding Station, which is now a project and uh, that will take the form, the fundraiser will take the form of something called Christmas in July. It's a raffle, and we'll talk about more about that in a moment. Uh, there are some links there that you can go to learn more about the bird banding stations. And this is to protect the migratory birds uh, when they winter in Central and South America, the ones that we have here during uh, summer, spring migration. Uh, Bruce is presented and is going to continue tonight uh, to help uh, all of us talk about the mission and vision. Some principles will be added and guidelines for uh, guardians of nature. Um, Gloria will talk about the junior guardians programming and I will begin to discuss a couple of things uh, that we're going to uh, talk about in June. Uh, quick updates. Uh, remember, try to if you're updating on a project, just keep it a little short. Talk about your successes and challenges, but most importantly, talk about what you need. Uh, what do you want? Uh, what, from your perspective at your project, what is needed next? Who do you need, and what skills do you need? Uh, always offer constructive feedback. Get we always have contact information available for the project leaders. And like we like to say, knit the networks. So we behave in ways that build trust and respect with one another. And always try to bring a friend, whether it's a family member or a friend, to help us grow the network. Report progress to the group so that everything remains open and everyone remains as informed as possible. And as I said, in, feel free to invite, invite a friend. Now, tonight, uh, this is our schedule tonight. And the first item is the Guardians of Nature uh, policy. And I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Um, so, Bruce, please step up and uh, tell us a little bit more about that. And everyone, feel free to please un unmute your mics so that we can have a discussion, comments, and conversation. Thank you. 
Are you going to bring a draft of the discussion up? Yes, I will. Hang on just a moment. Okay, please tell me what you're looking at. It's starting at the top with the uh, prepared by George. Good. Okay. And this is as large as I can expand it. That's okay. I got my glasses on. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Okay. And everyone, please chime in. <laughs> On the right hand side there, do you see anything from a rich or changes? From a rich? I believe it was rich. Where, where is he? Uh, Betsy, maybe yes. we need to scroll down. Okay. All right, where where exactly are you looking at, Bruce? It doesn't seem, uh, Bruce. Uh, did he email you maybe directly and not put it on the document? Uh, I don't know if he. I think he did put it on the document because I saw it a couple hours ago. He just huh. made a couple changes in there. Can you tell us again what it was exactly? Unfortunately, no. He shortened up the uh, first sentences of the um, mission statement. And I think he just changed one word under guardians of nature, nature vision number one. The All right. First word he changed. I'm looking at the revisions. I think you should see those as well. I don't see any revisions that were made uh, by him. I see the last one was made by Gloria Ferris at 614 tonight. Okay. Well, I, if you're talking about to promote an appreciation for and development of responsible stewardship, that first, uh, I, I like who I... If I think that is quite good and should be the way it is, um, I really like that. And uh, so I thought that was you, Bruce, that, uh, and he, George. He kept, he kept that in there, and I think was he shortened out the regardless of age, income, gender, that whole sentence he put on uh, one word in there. Well, I, I personally am okay that we mention all that. I, I didn't see that, but uh, I mean, if we can find Rich and try to get him back in the conversation, you know, of course we could consider anything, but I think that's a good first uh Way to begin it. That's just my. Uh, it has my vote. Anyone else? Nate, what do you think? And hello. Hi, how are you guys? Very good. Nice to see you. Yeah, I, I showed up a little late. I, uh, That's but, right. I'll send you the recording link. Thank you. She sounded very interesting. Very. Very. You'll want to listen to that. Yeah, yeah, very I unusual. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, no, but you guys are talking about the final sentence in the mission statement. The right. Yeah. Um, 
I agree it's a good thing uh, to put in, but I also don't think it's completely necessary to be so um, specific. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you say we are an all-inclusive um, society almost, or, you know, that's just my opinion, but I, I also can see where you guys are coming from by breaking it down. Uh, but I, I honestly, I have, you know, no, you know, um, they brings up a good point. We could say, uh, cooperation by all, uh, of a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community and just yeah. make community the overall word I, I don't know T- what Tammy I think you want to say something please step in uh, I I just um, so obviously uh, this is this is just my two cents um, I'm actually giving a small talk on um, diversity equity and inclusion with Western Kohaiga Kohlhaga Audubon um, in the coming months, but um, it, if you you want your audience to feel welcome, um, while it may not feel necessary to just specifically call things out, um, people will feel more welcome if you specifically say, yes, you are welcome. Instead of giving a, a general message, it's essentially saying, no, no, we recognize and are inclusive, and here's how we are inclusive. Okay. Um, it would be like it would be it's like a party invitation, right? You might yeah. say, "Oh, everyone's welcome," but if you have your specific name on it and someone hands it to you and says, "No, no, we want you to come," that feels more welcoming versus just a general all-inclusive thing. Not that either one is bad. It just depends on how you're wanting to be inclusive. Do you want people to just have a generalized idea or do you want to actively attract um, diversity into this program? Does that make sense? Yes. That is Um, great suggestion. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Bruce. Um, I've then given Tammy's input uh, I believe that we should keep it specific so that people will feel very welcome because I I have a tendency that it's human nature to say, well, yes, they say that, but they probably don't mean me because we have a self-esteem issue. So <laughs> I think it might be a, a, a good way to kind of envelope, like make it, uh, very welcoming. Yeah. I also want to say that you guys, um, I really, I really think it's great that you made the difference between um, uh, social status, education, race, and ethnicity, because a lot of people think that ethnicity necessarily means someone's um, racial, uh, what they identify as, um, and a lot of people. Um, actually find that really exclusionary, especially people who are um, Latino, um, because obviously being Hispanic necessarily isn't a, a race. Like you're not, you, your race isn't Mexican. That's your culture. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I think you guys, like that actually looks really good. Um, you could pare it down and it would still be just as effective, but that is just my two cents. Um, Nothing you say is invalid. Um, all of the ideas you guys presented were very valid um, and totally reasonable. That's just um, in my experience. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm sorry if that stepped on any toes. I do apologize. No. Um, no. You're fine. You're fine. Thank you. That's, You're that's good. the whole point of this is open and honest communication. Right. Right. <laughs> Nate's got it. Yep. Awesome. That's it. And well, the thank you for being receptive to that. I appreciate it. All right. Um, would shall we move on then? 
Sure. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right, vision statement. Um, I, I started making some, uh, I just added as, which was a, uh, when you hovered over the so to, it said uh, the uh, recommendation was to do so as to maintain, maintain, maintain. And to me, I just thought it was a, a clearer uh, way to say that you wanted to maintain the sustainable life for all is to add the as. So I went ahead and did that, but if anybody has an objection to it, uh, that's fine with me. I, I did. I just thought it made it uh, uh, more readable, clearer uh, myself. I like it because it it infers um, relationability. I don't even know if that's a word, but as as a consequence, as an outcome. Yeah, that's. Okay, and then in the in the next one, I just um, I guess these are the principles. In number three, I felt that um, fill the niche of responding to local environmental concerns. Guardian does not seek to replace other environmental groups. And period. Many of these groups operate on more regional and large-scale projects, and their bureaucracies are not suited to respond to local needs, to the local needs. I thought just to take out whole however, and make it two sentences, made it more why we uh, felt that we that our group is necessary for local needs versus a regional and uh, state department. Great. Is there any are there any reactions? Fine by me. Yeah, it sounds it sounds good. Okay, it, it, I'm it's clearly stating we're we're doing our part on the small scale, not trying to overlay you right. know, what metro parks are doing or the State Department. So, uh, you know, it, it works for what we are or what this will be. Right. Anyone else? Is Sean here? Or did Sean leave? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, all right. I just wondered if you had anything to add. Um, this isn't a biggie, but uh, be sure to speak up. <laughs> no, I, I actually don't have anything to add. I am definitely in agreement, um, and, and especially to what Tammy said for that first part. I totally agree with that. Leaving it very descriptive is definitely going to be, in my opinion, the, the best way to attack that. Um, for the second part here, again, in agreement. So, yeah, I really don't have anything else to add. That's, that's good. It's nice to hear your your conversation. Yes. Um, my okay. Ne next? My next one was, uh, I can't really read my little, but I think what it was, I instead of with other environmental groups, I said with these other environmental, environmental groups, uh, meaning that we would partner uh, with these larger groups when appropriate and and when we could. Um, so that was the other thing. And then I was, I just thought for the fifth one, I'd take out the uh, and just make it our available to use. Okay, what does everyone think on those two small points there? Number four, any feedback? If you take the other out, then it kind of makes other groups feel excluded. I didn't say take out other, I said add these. It, it would look like this. These with 
these other okay. feedback. Okay. <clears throat> The, the word I wanted to take out was the before youth. Right. How does that look to everyone? Fine by me. All right. Anyone else? You, you can certainly speak up if you're if you if it's affirmative for you. Um, I I just want to say taking out the youth the is probably a good step just because. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 30, so technically, uh, I I was the youth. <laughs> uh, being told I am the youth was always like, but but am I really though? So yeah, that's probably a good move. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. Um, what's next, Bruce? Well, you just want to keep continuing down. Whatever you want. Yeah. What's what's our our next objective? Okay, everyone's okay with the background description of putting in where I. You know, I wasn't. I at I I put something over in the comments, but I don't see it yeah. at all. Um, no, uh, it, it's not there. Yeah, this is what I said. It. I think this is instead of being um, something that has all the makings of being sentences and everything, it's, it, it looks to me like those were the points that went um, of what we wanted to make. And I think that um, what we wanted to do, that WCA, the WCAS board uh, acts as our governing body and the history of the Guardians of Nature uh, is that we are an outgrowth of uh, the Conservation Lab uh, due to the fact that uh, COVID-19 uh, made us uh, change from face-to-face -face moving to make a pivot to online meetings. And then um, the name Guardians of Nature uh, was uh, coined during the the Urban Birding Cleveland Initiative, and other you I put UBC in uh, parentheses before initiative, and then. Um, Uh, hence, we are the WCAS. Uh, well, I said that uh, w, that the Guardians Nature is a program of WCAS. All right, that's a, a rough frame. Um, obviously, we need to write it up. Um, and yeah, produce, it needs to produce be. a draft for this group so that they can eyeball it, see if there's anything you want to add or delete or or uh, see if what you think, and then we can firm it up and then publish it. Right. Um, does anyone have any comments about this? So it's it's about in the need to include a background description, the backstory of how. Uh, who, what, and why, and where uh, is Guardians of Nature? Um, I'm just going to chime in. That does help clarify it for me, you know, okay. seeing that I've only, you know, recently joined. Yeah. Uh, it does help clarify how you guys came about this process. So someone stepping in, they could read that brief description, you know, once we iron it down. And yeah. understand, okay, that that makes sense to how they stumbled upon, you know, this next venture. Good. Well, it's, it's a little rough right now, but we can certainly e and easily yeah. fine tune it. Yeah, the, the, I, the, would, uh, 
Go ahead. I was trying to remember from my memory, and that's not exactly what I said, but it's basically what I thought we needed to do as a background description. Good. All right. All right. Excellent. What's next, Bruce? You want me to keep going? Yes. Yep. Okay. Where we're forming the pillars of of this initiative so that it can grow strong. And we need to have you um, submit it to the board uh, as to what we have adopted and uh, so that they can uh, add their feedback and suggestions as to what they would like to see us put in this document. So, so that's, uh, I would say we'd be ready for that uh, at the next board meeting, which is what, Monday, June 21st, I think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So okay. yes, keep on going, Bruce. Okay, all right. Okay. From this point on, these are just rambling thoughts in my head of what I feel should be incorporated in the project. Well, okay. uh, this isn't the project. Yep. You're doing the whole underlying what governs our projects, why we choose the projects we do, based on right. what you're saying. So that's just what I would clarify. So you, you're, these ideas are some ventures you would like to reach out with this Guardians of Nature. That's kind of what you're saying, right? These are ideas that I feel should be incorporated one way or another to make it a total comprehensive package to what we are doing, not just a one sentence thing that covers all. So, and I was wondering if this, this, this next chunk of information I don't know if it's possible, but I was wondering if uh, we could pull extract or form, you know, like a principles and a, a, like a credo um, uh, that could help guide the um, project development in the future. But the uh, same as what I, you suggested, Bruce. Well, I, I just threw out ideas and things that I feel should be in there, things that other people aren't touching on that I feel are important. I feel there's too much out there of people telling you to do something and people kind of get turned off after a while, it's no one's explaining to them how everything is connected and why we need to do this and how just by taking one step out of the process could change the whole environment. Give people more of a background of just how interconnected everything is and how this planet works on a simple basis. This this goes back uh, to what uh, John Muir, the John Muir quote that Patty oh. Donilon shared with us about uh, we, are, uh, we are of nature, not uh, separate from nature and that we're all interconnected. Um, you know, Bruce, I think that you would be, you've thought about this, you've done a lot of uh, thinking. Um, I 
think that in this instance, now I think what we need is for somebody to articulate it and give us a, a post on a, a blog post or or a uh, brief, you know, a, a small maybe one to two page uh, article that encompasses what you're talking about and I think we can even tonight uh, Tammy's uh, bringing environment uh, disasters to the individual I think what we've always kind of talked about Bruce and what you gave me uh, for some of the junior guardians was to show this interconnectedness uh, that one uh, video you shared with us that were like a blip in time given uh, how long we've been on earth and how much we've changed it uh, You're talking about Facebook post yes yes the three minute yes the three-minute post I mean all of that kind of works into what could be a very good uh, article about what we would like to achieve with our projects uh, through our projects uh, guardians of nature uh, by bringing it down to what we as individuals can do, what we as small grassroots groups can do, and how all of this snowballs and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until we have a, a shift in thinking and behavior and we make the world better for what we thought. So to me, uh, I think you're a good person to to write that the last thing you wrote for us uh, that Betsy put on the news blog I believe it was the, new, the news blog was policy. wonderful policy it was about yeah. the policy I think this is the same same kind of thing um, that is what our credo should be and maybe by your thoughts you get the rest of us thinking about it and we can add our own uh, article, our own thoughts. We could just keep building on why we are a part of the Guardians, maybe. Mm -hmm. And just have you be the catalyst that starts us thinking. <clears throat> That's my two cents. <laughs> maybe it's five cents. <laughs> you have probably a quarter. Oh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Bruce thinks I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this whole, you know, you're, you're trying to promote, you know, uh, how everything is interconnected, how we must be aware and, uh, you know, create that social awareness um, to what, everything you know has an effect on from a minuscule thing to you know like uh, Tammy said wild wildfires in you know uh, the West Coast mm -hmm. so it, it's that that's pretty much what you're trying to you know encompass Bruce I'm trying to get a lot of ideas into people's head to help them better understand how and why things are on this planet. Case in point, the environment is one of the biggest factors in what lives where it lives and why it is the way it is. And going all the way back in history to our beginning, 
in Africa, why was our skin black? Why was our noses big? Why did we have color in curly hair? Why is it when we migrated up into Europe, all of a sudden we started getting blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin? Why as we go into uh, different parts of Asia, people will have shorter arms and legs and are shorter than we are. It's just how the environment impacts every living animal and being on this planet. So I like that. But the thing is, when you get in such a overarching concept, it's hard to, you know, narrow that in for this program you're trying to add on. It, that's just my two cents, um, y you know, because if, if it goes from, you know, species adaptation to, you know, how the environment is, you're just, your spectrum is so large to promote that in, like you said, you know, a community college or some of that. It, it's, it's a large overarching concept that is hard to grasp and teach in a short period of time because not everyone has the attention span or the willingness to retain all that information. So I, I think you need to hit them hard with something, and then once you grasp them, uh, you you continue their involvement. But again, I'm just spitting my two cents. I have to agree. Um, I was a little concerned when you said that about the solar system. Um, I do think we need to be a little bit more focused. Um, we we keep uh, talking about uh, grassroots, uh, local. Uh, I think we need to uh, bring our we have like a laser like focus to uh, what uh, we can do in a project sense um, and I think uh, your three minute video of how long we've been on earth and how much we've changed it um, I think that, uh, oh, I can't remember. Oh, Snoop Dogg is doing this um, I don't know, this adaptation of with the tortoise, with the turtle, and they're talking about single use plastic and how our single use plastic is just kind of our whole world, the oceans, everything is being overtaken by all this plastic. And how can we as individuals do something about that? Um, it's really one thing I want to do with the Guardians of Nature. And um, talking about that, I would like to, um, if we could, and if Bruce doesn't care, uh, I think we're ready to do the first things first, which is to uh, present the vision mission statement to uh, the board and then maybe work on the principles and the ideals and maybe what informs our projects. Uh, so if we could move on to the uh, junior guardians, I'd like to. 
And this is what I have to say. I okay, think, hang, hang on. Hang on. Okay. Is everyone good with that? Yeah. Fine by me. Okay, uh, Nate, are you here? And Sean. Um, so. Sean, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, this is um, good to go. The mission and the vision. Um, Bruce, if you would present it to the board at the next board meeting, and then as Gloria stated, uh, is everyone good? We'll keep working on the other add-ons that we we at this time envision to be added on. Everybody good? Good by well, me. Okay, um, good. All right. What I'd like to state about Guardians, since we're such a small group, what I'd like to do is do what we did for the book club and hold a special session of people who may be interested in Junior Guardians and working on the programming and the membership uh, so that for the June Guardians meetings, we will be able to move forward. Um, and I would suggest that we do that the first or second week in June. And Betsy, you put out a, uh, oh, uh, I'll write an invitation and we'll ask sure. people for help. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, I think the next thing after Guardian, Junior Guardians was the Christmas in July raffle. And I'm hoping since Nate, is here <laughs> that he maybe is uh, willing to get his feet wet with uh, a project and help uh, Michelle with uh, the Christmas in July raffle. And I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I, I would hope that you might be uh, willing to do that and I will uh, Betsy and I will introduce you to Michelle online and then maybe uh, you and Michelle and Betsy can get together and uh, talk about some things uh, but I do know that uh, Michelle wanted us to move on and work about it and work on it so uh, it's 8.30, so I don't know if people would like to just, uh, the things that I have down here, um, if they would like to uh, go on for about 10, 15 more minutes, or if they would rather uh, do this in an email way. Um, I'm okay with 15 more minutes. I just wonder if everybody else is, if they have places to be or things to do. I'm good for a little bit longer because uh, I would definitely like to talk about this. Okay, good. All right. Bruce, what about you? If you give the two-cent version. Good. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, Betsy, I think we could put uh, Nate in there is the co-leader and take me out after this meeting. Okay. So, right, Nate? Yeah, good. I'll do my best. Uh, okay, good. All right. So, um, Betsy and I had a small uh, conversation about this. Can we, um, do we want to go to the, oh, let's just stay on this. Okay, uh, Here's here's what we were we're discussing. Do we want to do a raffle slash silent auction, or do we want to do simply a raffle? And um, Betsy and I had a short discussion about this the other day, and Betsy thinks that a raffle and a small silent auction is doable and we would use this first uh, Christmas in July raffle slash silent auction as our pilot 
for using these online options uh, as an alternative to face-to-face -face, uh, auctions that we had in the past, given the fact that if we do get to go back to meeting face-to-face -face for our uh, members' meetings the first Tuesday of every month, we, we would probably do that. But um, I think we want to also test the waters and see how a raffle, uh, an online raffle slash silent auction works. So, um, Michelle, I, I want to just interject um, for everyone who, who, if you don't know, so we wouldn't would not be using proprietary software for this auction and the auction is is really you know it's a small beta one um, but I think I may have a way just to do it simply with uh, using collaborative technologies just the uh, our Google suite tools um, and we can try try it with that supporting supporting a small online auction and raffle um, uh, using using the Google tools. Yeah, sorry, hold me. What? Uh. Um, well, so uh, for the raffle, uh, we need a price of tickets. Uh, Michelle uh, was a bit confused with my um, rationale, but um, if we sold our tickets at $5 a ticket, and the average uh, buy for someone who bought was twenty dollars. We would need fifty uh, raffle buyers to make a thousand dollars. So um, that seems like a good idea, uh, Betsy has given us a, uh, and this is on our fundraise, uh, fundraising Christmas and July working document, that uh, we have some things that we were going to have for silent auctions and for uh, raffle items so that we can, we have a start to do raffle items and then um, for silent auction, we would get some donations and we would set a minimum bid uh, for those. But and minimum bids are usually either a third. They're usually a third of what the total value is of the item, and then the bids start. Uh, in five dollar increments so that you don't have fifty cents a dollar you know whatever uh, so those would be the two things but um, so um, I did this Michelle did a thing for the Ottawa National Preserve uh, they did a, a raffle um, the way they did it, you you paid five dollars a ticket. I purchased four, so that was twenty dollars. So um, they had four raffle bundles: one, two, three, four. So I bought four tickets. So I had four chances put into their random drawing that I might win one of the four bundles. And that was as simple as it was, was you uh, could buy one ticket, you could buy as many tickets as you want, and that gave you how many chances you had in the random dot drawing to be picked. Um, so that needs to be decided as to... Uh, does five dollars a ticket seem reasonable uh, to you, Nate and Bruce and Betsy, or 
and you know, of course, Michelle will be in on this as well. Uh, but what do you think? Um, I think it it kind of depends on, upon what's being bundled. Um, you know, a price a price valuation is pretty much what draws people in, or something that uh, yeah, you know, it really intrigues them. You know, when you bought those four tickets, was there something you wanted out of the four? Or there were, there were actually two bundles that I would have really liked to have. One was a bird. Uh, it was kind of like a backyard retreat, uh, like bundle that you got bird feeder, you got. Uh, bird bath, you got a uh, bird seed, and there was something else that you you got uh, for that. And then the other one was, uh, I think it was more of like an optics thing that you got, like binoculars and uh, something like that kind of thing. So there were two of the four that I thought I would really like, and chances are, I mean, depending on how many people, I didn't get it. I didn't win because they've had their drawing and nobody uh, notified me. But I really thought that twenty dollars uh, was worth worth was the, worth the, the chances. Yeah, <laughs> were worth yeah. the chances. So uh, Michelle has uh, said she will donate a prize. Um, that she'll donate something either to the auction or to put in a bundle or whatever. Once we decide, and Betsy um, has a photo album of uh, things that she's already taken photos of that might be bundled. Um, I know that we had several books. We have a whole bunch of stuff uh, that we could work on. Um, so I, I just don't know. Um, or we could do it like a... Uh, Betsy and I discussed this, and Betsy thinks it's possible. We could do uh, bundle number one, bundle number two, bundle number three, and bundle number four, and you could buy all four tickets for one bundle, which would be different than what Ottawa did. They simply... Uh, you, you, you bought tickets and... And they just so did a random easy. drawing, right? Yeah. But uh, we we thought that Betsy thought that that was doable. If somebody said they wanted to buy four tickets for bundle number one, and we could make a list of what was in that bundle, then um, they could buy twenty dollars worth of tickets for that. Yeah. So they get four chances for that one bundle. Um, you may get more people, or they might buy ten dollars for that one and twenty dollars for another one or $10 for another one and $10 for a third. So you might get more money. Um, yeah. So that was, so that's a possibility. And then, um, of course, uh, I think Betsy thought, uh, suggested three to five bundles and as the possibility. And for silent auction items, it would be, five to seven silent auction. And the silent auction is what will be more difficult because somebody will have to, well, Betsy has an idea of how to update it so everybody would know what the last bid was and they could keep track of the uh, items. But the first bid, of course, would be the minimum bid and then we would say that uh, any additional bid would be in $5 increments. So say you have something that's uh, got a value of uh, $60 and you start the bidding at 20 well, the first person gets 20 Well, if somebody bids then 25 and then the first person sees the 25 well, then they still want it and the, they're willing to buy half, you know, 30 for it. And that that will be how the birding goes up. 
uh, in that way. But here is a lot of the things um, that we would have for uh, possible for bidding and that we could put into bundles or do some way. I, I just write, um, I just thought, okay, you get a cup, you get a pound of coffee, and you get a bird book. Uh, or you get a, this cardinal serving tray of a cup. And, and then here's one that is you get a bird, bird bath or a seed. It's, I think it's a seed thing and you have some other things. And then we have some uh, other things that might work better as a uh, silent auction with uh, some artwork. And then um, Sean um, has uh, offered uh, a uh, winner's choice of his five photos with the poem that he made. So, uh, so that's that's where we're at with that. So, um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. The, we decided, I think, last month or last time on the 20th that uh, our drawing date would be Sunday, July 25th, and that our launch date would be, I don't know, two weeks before that, four, uh, 14 days maybe? For the silent auction and the raffle? Yeah, <clears throat> maybe have, uh, or yeah, like maybe have the raffle uh, two year. weeks and the silent auction a week of that, you know, the next week. And I think it's silent auction, you wouldn't want to run as long as you would the raffle. No. Uh, yeah, okay, well, that's good, good, and good I thing, think Kate. Like I said, I, or like you said, and kind of Betsy mentioned, it all depends on uh, you know how how we're we're figuring this software will work. You, yeah. You know? Right. Okay. Um, so so the raffle, how how long how long would you envision a, a raffle to to go for? Or, well, or it doesn't right. I, I, I think um, the Ottawa one went for uh, like 14 days. And, and is that a time period then that people are are able to buy, buy a ticket? Yes, that's what okay. it should be. And then we want to know what our cutoff date would that be. If we, if we draw on July 25th, I think we would want our cutoff day to be three the days before or... or what, um, it, four days? Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it all depends on how we're able to, you know, calculate which tickets were bought and, you know, you know which, I think we should which give bundle they, they purchased for. So, I think we should give ourselves at least four days. Why don't you just make it a week? Okay. So, start. So, pretty much start the raffle. Three weeks ahead of the drawing date, but only, you know, let it run for two weeks. Right. You know, so we, we can calculate and get everything situated beforehand. And then maybe have the silent option run for a week. Uh, maybe that week while we're, you know, while we're calculating all the raffle tickets, that allows yeah. us. Uh, yeah. You know, all on the the one day, the drawing day, we can announce um, bundles and silent auction items, kind of, you know, in a sequential order. Yeah. If, if you really wanted to. That sounds good. That sounds really good, Nate. So that we can have it all scheduled. Yeah, and, uh, and we could, you know, you could even do, a, you know. A, conference call, you know, announcing winners and, you know, saying That'd be nice. That'd how be nice. we can get it to you or contact us. So, mm -hmm. Right. 
Because that's one one thing, you know, you guys have even mentioned, you want to get engagement upon your site. So if you get people to purchase these tickets and then you shoot them, you know, if they buy these tickets online or, I don't know, in person, I don't know how these tickets are going to be. You follow follow it up with, um, you know, attend Sunday, July 25th conference call meeting or, you know, to see if you won, that's more than likely going to get people to come to the site, see what we're about, and then maybe they become a little bit more interested in the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. Mm -hmm. Good, good good thing. Okay, Bruce, your two cents. Any thoughts? I mean, you could think about this and, 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 say to me later, but if you've got anything top of mind that you are thinking of, it would probably be a good time. Nate sounded good by me. Yeah, I think Nate's ideas are really, really good for this. Um, Now, um, we probably should do something about donations. How, um, like Michelle has said she will do a donation. Maybe put that down somewhere. I don't think we have a uh, we can fill in the state. Yeah. But uh, should we have a thing for our members to be able to donate um, items for the silent auction or the um, or should we wait and see what we have and then put out a thing about would you, you know, would anybody like to donate? Uh, so yeah. here's my input. You can ask for donations. You know, I've even considered, you know, do- donating a, bite, a bundle or something. But if we don't want to raffle them all off or put them in the silent auction, that allows for another auction to be followed up in the near future. It, it, for a it's different a, cause. Yeah, it, it's one of those to where if your item doesn't go in this auction, it's possible for it to go in the next as long as that person's okay with it. That's good. It, that's it, that's good. just my opinion because we could get, you know, 15 more items donated and all that does is add more work for us. Yeah, and and we don't want that uh, for this one because this is our pilot. This is our right. first time. And uh, Betsy, you may want to put down that I said I would um, donate a, a pound of the Birds and Beans coffee. Um or something. So if we did a bundle with that, you know, the tray and the uh, things, I'll I'll donate the the coffee for that. I got three kids. I can donate. <laughs> <laughs> no, you no, don't. I've only no. got one living at home. <laughs> so. Oh, is that Sean? Sean, you're still here. You've been too quiet. Yes. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm still here. I'm, I'm just okay. listening in. All right. Oh, and Sean, um, he wanted to donate uh, the winner's choice, uh, the poem and photo. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, that that sounds good. And also, too, for, for any of these future ones, um, I can – easily donate some of my photography that I can get blown up into more of a poster size um, and get it framed, uh, you know, make it real look real nice and everything. I've, I've got a couple of them hanging on my wall that, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm a little biased because they're my photos, but you know, they're, they're sharp and they look nice. So oh, I don't, I don't mind you. doing that either. Okay. We, will, we may want to uh, ask Tom Fishburn too because I know that at one point Tom said that he had some photographs that were framed on um, archival uh, 
paper. Yeah, he gave, and, that's right. He gave all of those to us. I have well, a description of what it is. Yeah. With So we may want to have one or two of those in mm-hmm. the silent auction. He doesn't feel that uh, people are wanting the framed uh, photos as much. He believes that now the trend is that people like them on canvas so that they look a little, yeah, Nate's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's the whole the whole thing. Artwork is up to whatever you enjoy. Yes, exactly. So, um, um, I I like photographs. I have them all over my walls. So, yeah. Um, all so, right. That's okay. Well, um, it, well, we've gone for twenty minutes, so I think we have quite a bit that we can tell uh, Michelle about um, and maybe um, Betsy, you and Nate and uh, Michelle and I can meet to talk about some of these things in more detail and then um, I will just step away from that and go to uh, Junior Guardians and Nate and Michelle and you can uh, and whomever else would like to be on the committee. Uh, Sean, um, if you'd like to be on that committee, it would be a great help, uh, I'm sure. And uh, then you can look at all the things that Betsy's taken photographs of and um, maybe come up with bundles, how many, and and si- some silent auction uh, items and come up with the dates that's three weeks out that whole thing that uh, Nate already had figured out, which is really good. Uh, my vote would be for a $5 ticket for the raffle because to me that makes it very affordable to, for anyone to give to the IBP project, the International Banding Station project. And I think, again, uh, yes, we want if we had 50 donors and they bought twenty dollars worth of raffle tickets, we would make a thousand dollars. To me, that seems like a goal uh, that is achievable. And but the other thing is we do want to make it economically feasible for anybody to. If they can only give five dollars, then they could give five dollars. If they can give ten dollars, then you know. And if somebody can give fifty, more power to them, you know. So I think that's the way we ought to go with this raffle part of that. And then with the silent auction, I just think that we should go either a third or half of estimated value. Um, so that's. I would think that Sean's framed photo would be uh, a higher estimated value than an unframed uh, photo. So uh, that would be all up to you guys. And I'm ready to stop. (laughs) Okay. Good. Betsy, do you want to talk about digital transformation a little bit before we end? Uh, Do you want to start uh, June with that? Just, just uh, for, for in June, we'll talk uh, more about a, a digital transformation fund um, to support digital transformation at WCIS. That's a future topic, um, but uh, I believe a necessary one. Um, the book club, by the way, just looking uh, up the sheet here, um, they have a few uh, updates, but they're, they're working, and Drina was not able to come this evening, nor was Lisa. Uh, we did get the policy addressed. And the, the last thing um, that, that really is important to work on, and that will be coming in June, uh, is uh, to um, develop a nominating panel team, a team for, uh, to recruit new board members and to implement a uh, nomination schedule of, um, from uh, the public have uh, board board uh, nominations um, uh, um, formed and proposed to the board 
and then nominations confirmed, so a whole schedule. So we can talk some more about that. And the links to all of these topics uh, and their documents are, are here on this document. I will email you a follow-up information uh, with all of this information. Does anyone have anything they would like to add before we say goodbye? Yeah, Betsy, I'm going to chime in for just a moment here um, in regards to the in regards to the raffle and the auctions and such. Um, little known fact, I'm actually a DJ. Uh, I haven't been doing that because of COVID, but during my time DJing, uh, I did do a lot of parties and events. And at these, they definitely had 50-50 raffles, um, prize baskets, raffles, and things like that. Um, I think what we would really benefit from adding would be, you know, a $5 raffle ticket charge is a good price, but give it a, uh, give somebody the incentive to spend more. So give it a five for 20. So essentially they're getting one raffle ticket free, um, but that usually inspires people to buy more. Also, with having these bundles, if we can make it so that people can put their tickets into whatever bundle they're looking to get, I feel that usually works out better. Yeah, you may get things to be a little un, uneven sometimes because one bundle may be po more popular than the other, um, but then people may decide, oh, man, I'm going to buy a bunch of raffle tickets and I'm just going to dump them all into this one because this is the one that I want. Um, I've definitely seen that happen before. So I, I believe those two ideas, if we can implement them, would be good. And it would just generate just that little bit extra for people to really be incentivized to go ahead and spend and, and, and drop Okay. All right. So, um, isn't that called a Chinese auction? No, that that's a little bit different. Um, so, just so I have my notes correct on the second point, Sean, um, how would I write it here? Uh, you, uh, you uh, the option for people to put an unlimited number of raffle tickets. Uh, um, or a designated bundle. Yeah. How yeah, shall if, I? If, how shall I note note this? Um, if we have the ability to allow people to uh, designate where their raffle ticket goes, oh, okay. so rather than being like the other one that was referenced, where it was just a, a generic auction and you just bought tickets and whenever your name got called, that's what you won. Um, but if we have the option so that people can say, I definitely want bundle number three, so I'm putting my tickets in bundle number three, then okay. that way they aren't even considered for like bundle one or two or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Just, mm -hmm. um, Betsy, this is what you and I talked about, and you said you thought it was possible that they could buy, they could say on bundle number one, I want to buy 10 tickets or five tickets or whatever. And um, Sean, I'm glad you brought that up because I agree with that. I think if they buy five tickets uh, it, it, and we sell them for 20 bucks, um, they get a free ticket for every uh, $20 they spend, they will spend more money. That is true, because I've done that. And Bruce, yes, they were at one point called Chinese raffles, but they are now called something else. Um, it, I, I can't, it's, I don't know what it is, but you just put a brown paper bag in front of the bundle or whatever if we were having it live, and people put all their tickets in that one. They would get their tickets and they would get their choices. We're only doing this online, so it'll be a little different. It'll be bundled one, two, three, four, or whatever is decided how many bundles we have. So. Okay, good. Anybody else? Last call for comments. I think Sean should volunteer for the raffle since he was a DJ. He can be our MC or uh, do our uh, 
drawing for <laughs> the uh, July 25th. I just volunteered you, Sean, if you didn't realize. <laughs> Sean, can you I, confirm I, that? I, I see that. Um, what I can say is I definitely want to help out on some of these projects, and I have a few ideas floating around myself, too. Um, right now, um, work is absolutely horrendous for me, and I've been putting in oh, way more right. hours than I need to. That's right. Um, I forgot that. So it's one of those I don't want to commit to something that I may not necessarily be able to actually fulfill. So from a, I, I don't mind being in the background. I don't mind if people want to bounce ideas off of me, um, anything like that. Uh, like you said, if, if we do need an MC, I have no problem being an MC. No problem doing any of that. Um, Thanks. However, that works out. I, I have no problem there. Uh, but like okay. I said, I, I don't want. Well, to let's just to say you're the tentative MC for July 25th, and if you can, uh, if you can uh, do it, then you do it, and then we'll we'll have a backup. Uh, yeah, that's that's not a problem. Yeah, with with that being a weekend, weekends are, are definitely much more available to me. And, and that's then not so you be would, an issue then you would have no problem with you being copied uh, in emails that float back and forth between Betsy, Nate, and Michelle, and myself to add the you gross. to the list. Uh, just so that you yeah, can... Yeah, that's, that's no problem. Okay, All right. good. Good. Um, all right, folks, thank you so much. Um, it's 9.04, so oh, thank you for done. your time, your energy, your attention. I hope that you um, found some um, inspiration uh, in our speaker. Um, and I will communicate with you by email and let you know uh, what's coming up for next month for our meetings and also communicate with you in between as a follow-up. If you need anything, just email me or call me or anyone else here. All right. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.